Galatians 4, 4, and 5. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So God sent forth a son made under the law. The condemnation that came upon us because of Adam's fall was reversed because Jesus took it and exhausted it for us. And if we were told, if you, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. When we receive the Spirit of Christ then, by yielding to him, we experience the victory he came to give. Victory over self. In Christ, our human self-will, which he took on, was constantly struggling to assert itself. But Jesus kept it absolutely surrendered to his Father's will and therefore emptied it of self. We are told in Romans 15, 3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. He therefore emptied our human nature, which he took on, of self. Moreover, in order to empty our humanity of self, he emptied himself as the eternal Son of God and came all the way down from the Godhead to the level of fallen mankind. Furthermore, he went into and endured the eternal death of the first condemnation for us. That was equivalent to being made sin. Can you imagine? From infinity to less than nothing in order to redeem us. John 5.30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who hath sent me. And then, of course, Philippians 2, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a slave, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Gethsemane, the human self-will made its ultimate effort to control his mind. But he said, Not my will, but thine be done. Luke twenty two forty two. And when Christ died the eternal death of our condemnation, he gave up the human self-will, the flesh, the old man, the ego egocentric eye to that death. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So when we are in Christ, the self the flesh, the old man, the eye, is crucified, dead, and buried. And later on, we will see how Jones expounds upon that. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, not the I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. So the Christian life is a death to self, a death to self and the world. Of course, we still need to experience what a deeper death to self, what a death to self really is. You know, the final point says the whole world will be against us. They'll be saying all sorts of bad things against us, planning to kill us. And we must maintain an attitude of absolute forgiveness towards them, of goodwill towards them, to reflect the character of Christ in the universe. We must hold no grudge. 
If they do us well, we cannot. We do them well. So that, that is what death itself really means. And then that our Christ, Galatians 5, 24, then that our Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and desires. And Romans 6 says, Turn this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. All the sins of mankind which flowed from the Adamic condemnation were laid upon Christ, laid upon his soul. And he felt that corporate guilt as if it were his very own. All the tendencies to sin in our fallen human flesh were imparted to him by being in his flesh, ours which he took on. And while bearing our sin and guilt, he also conquered at the root all our tendencies to sin which were in our corporate sinful flesh which he took on. You see what a tremendous victory? He therefore remained absolutely sinless in character and produced the perfect obedience of faith for us. So he perfectly obeyed faith working by love and surrendering all. He perfectly obeyed for us as us. And then he died for us. Romans 8, 1 to 4, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit all of this Christ did for all mankind and therefore both legally and practically he is our righteousness when the sinner hears this good news of God's amazing agape love through Christ the sinner's heart is melted into repentance and confession. When by faith the sinner surrenders all to Jesus, the righteousness of Christ is imputed and imparted to the believing sinner who is thereby justified by faith and born again. He is renewed in the spirit of his mind and radically changed from carnal-minded rebellion against God's law to spiritual-minded submission and obedience to God's law. Paul tells us in Romans 8, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So we see, uh, of course, this takes, this is very deep. We may understand it superficially, but it is deep. It will take endless ages to to grasp, which means we should never fully grasp how the Son of God is his Godhood and divine nature could have been condensed to the size of the human ovarian egg to fuse with Mary's egg to produce the man Christ Jesus is a theobiology that we don't have a clue about. How the Holy Spirit could have condensed the second person of the Godhead into being such a small entity as 
the size of a cell to fuse with Mary's head. That's why the God is the God of Hebrew and even the decimal. Mysteries beyond our comprehension. But that happened to him. And Mary produced a man child. How that was, again, is beyond our comprehension. Because God does not carry human DNA. So you see, when Jesus raised the bell and speaking human, he said, This is the compulsory class in redemption, everybody will attend. We are told that there are going to be studies in astrophysics and other aspects of equation, and we can pick our choice, but studying the plan of redemption in the eternal ages, everybody will want to know more and more and more of that which is a little bit old. And then the man Christ Jesus, God, a man in one person, and yet not using his Godhood, just as a man dependent on his father. So it's to be our genuine example. Because if he had used his own divinity, I have no divinity to use. So he, laid, he rested that aside as a bear, and as a man dependent entirely on his father to keep him from falling and to keep us in him from going on with The of salvation is a deep, deep sin. The role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings to the believer and reproduces in the believer's mind all that Christ has done for us. The Holy Spirit is, is not another Savior. The Holy Spirit is another comforter who is the living agency through which all that Christ has done for us is imparted into our souls for conversion and spiritual growth unto perfection of character. We are told in John 16, How can it make the spirit of truth is come? He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. John 16, 13 and 14 and Romans 5, 5, but hope they have not ashamed, because the love of God is shut upon our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. Now the, 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 the fact that Christ lived in our sinful flesh as a man. And we may absolutely sin that's because he kept our fallen brain, which he took on, absolutely surrendered to his father, so that his thoughts were kept above sin, kept pure. That mindset, that thought pattern, that way of thinking and the content of his thoughts and the direction of his thoughts, always sinless. Because he remained absolutely surrendered to his Father, who filled him with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus produced sinlessness of character to dwell in our fallen flesh, which he took on. That too is a mystery. He did it for us, he did it as our example, and it is reproduced in us by the Holy Spirit. He is, the right, he is the righteousness of God, the seed of God, the Holy Spirit brings it in. The role of the believer. Christ has made us free moral agents. He has given us the power of choice, freedom of choice, and willpower. God intends that we use our willpower, our power of choice, and our freedom of choice in our response to his love and his gifts in the plan of salvation. We have to. Now take for example the sun, the sun doesn't get God in trouble, does it? Because the sun is not, doesn't have a mind. Trees don't get God in trouble. Except as we cause them to be uh, perverted. But we intelligent creatures have freedom of choice. We can choose to say no to God, we can choose to say yes to God. But if we 
became a treat, it would be uh, fairly easy for God to give it, wouldn't it? Sometimes the rich and children were a treat so that they wouldn't be benefit. Eh? Yeah. But they're free to have a free to have a free man. Therefore, she told me, 
But at that time, they pray for your children and pray for our children in church. They don't know how what is going on in a free mind. Because there's your child, you can't force the mind and make it over. But pray and instruct. Pray and instruct. Because all of us are free. He said, for example, your man is still in the Anglican church. And then your man is still in the church of God. When you are not like this now, if your brother had frozen you into Anglicanism, you couldn't have been free to choose that Anglicanism. So freedom is crucially important. And I thought, I thought about that because imagine all the religions in the world that go with this. He's training his children. Don't depart from this faith. This is the true church. All the, all the religions that they should do so. Thank God for freedom of choice. Because when the love of God goes to over, I'm sorry, then, so when my father meant well, uh, Christ is not a preacher. My father meant well, the car for the court doesn't come, he can't be this, he can't be that. My father meant well, then you move. Okay. That does not lead to a, a statement I read by a chap writing on the character of God. And I will, I will not mention what he said here because that is an exposure. But I will mention it. He said one of the most misunderstood texts in the Old Testament, which has to be interpreted by all other characters, God's statements, is the text which says, Straight up, the child of the way should go, and when it gets to it, shall not be departed. He says that is a character of God interpreted text. Otherwise, you, miss, you will miss miss understand it. So I know the explosion right in the law, so that will come in our full discussion. Okay? He says if you don't understand what it means, you will think that it means what God does not intend. And then it will not allow it will not allow for what has happened in the law right? that children can come from Islam, although they were trained in Islam, children can come from this all about being the law right because of their freedom of choice to choose life when they see it. So he says that text has a deeper meaning than people superficially take it to be. That very rightly, this year, the Pentecostal, not Pentecostal, the Protestant right now, the God. By the way, when I told you that he is uh, the, the subject when this character God people have come across his book and contacted him. So he's been living with them. And they're hoping that through that now we can get back to understand some of the religious principles because, because uh, eternal torment, eternal torment can't square with the character of God and he, he, he uh, is in that area. So let me show you guys into the Pardon? I know, I know, but these are, these are not, these are not, these are, uh, okay. So all the religious must come from here. Tower. It was our work with Christ. And if people if people consent even so I can accept with our thoughts and it notice these words, consent. Identify yourself with our thoughts and it. So then your hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be back carrying out our own impulses. I said no sometimes the law is the flow and sister Carolyn. And my brother, the truth was here, and then his brother played the organ. I, I can start. And they, they can play and look away and talk and so on because after years of training, it has become part. At first, uh, they told me that they were re re reluctant to go to uh, train, and the, the father insisted. But they, they, came, they reached a point where they eventually freed up the man and said, look, we can choose to learn. Now, I used to send, when my daughter was young, I used to send her to uh, Sister Lascelles. And she wasn't doing anything, doing anything, doing anything. So I stopped. Watch this now. My daughter is now sending her daughter, Ember, to music lessons. Watch it now. Hear my daughter to me. Daddy. I ain't gonna stop sending her, you know. I ain't gonna do like we do with me, you, because I was plenty food, you stop me. But I know God learned with her, and I ain't stopping sending her. I said, well, 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 boy. <laughs> this, this is a girl I saw in my office licking a, licking a child, licks like bees. 
Look in the child. The child is four, and she's uh, 16. So you know when she had the child. So her mother bought her, and at 12 cents, this hard. There's a girl one here. I think I ain't saying at all. And she vets and fussing. Now she's looking at the four-year-old, and she's 16. I said, uh, why are you looking at the child? So my hard ears. I said, you want hard ears? Well, uh, well I'm going to stop looking at her, though. But sooner or later, sooner or later, the, child's, the child, like us, to God, must freely consent and surrender. Force and fear have to give way to freedom and surrender for us to mature in love. Because the Bible tells us, perfect love casteth out fear. And if you fear, you're not going to be made perfect in a gap a character. So all true obedience comes from the heart. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. What a, what a wonderful paragraph. As Christ lived the law in humanity, so we may do if we will take hold of the strong for strength. But we are not to place the responsibility of our duty upon others and wait for them to tell us what to do. We cannot depend for counsel upon humanity. The Lord will teach us our duty just as willingly as he will teach someone else. This does not mean that somebody can't give you a, a piece of advice, you know. You know that? If we come to him in faith, he will speak his mysteries to us personally. Our hearts will often burn within us as one draws nigh to commune with us as did Enoch. Those who decide to do nothing in any line that will displease God will know after presenting their case before him just what course to pursue. And they will receive not only wisdom, but strength. Power for obedience, for service will be imparted to them as Christ has promised. Whatever was given to Christ, the all things. And the all things are mentioned in Romans. Paul says, what shall we then say to these things? If God did not spare his son, how will he not with him also freely give us all things? The all things to supply the need of fallen men was given to him as the head and representative of humanity. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Christ, our righteousness, wonderful indeed. Okay, uh, our time is almost gone, so I, if you have any questions or points before we uh, consider chapter 4 another time, we have five minutes. We have about five minutes for any questions. We have to close uh, by 5 to 10. Any questions or points? I uh, saw you, sorry. Uh, 12. Any questions or points? All right, let me get back. Let me open up this area now because it would be new for some people. Uh, two condemnations, two eternal deaths. Adam's fall brought a condemnation and an eternal death on the race. And if Christ did not die that death for us, Adam and we in Adam would have died an eternal death. There would be annihilation of the race, a death without any coming back. Christ took that guilt and shame, died that eternal death, and exhausted the penalty. That allowed physically, physically but a dying existence. 
So we have mortality and corruption. We survive physically. We die. We die because we are mortal and corrupt. And even from that death, there will be a resurrection. Now, so every person has had that condemnation reversed, and that is why we survive physically. Paul calls it justification of life. Also, remember at the cross, when Christ died, when Christ was being crucified, the whole world stood charged with the murder of the Son of God. But Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that prayer is actualized and realized for those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior. So for those who accept Jesus Christ as Savior, there is neither the first nor the second condemnation, and they will have eternal life, so long as they endure to the end. Those who reject Christ as Savior, the first condemnation has been passed. But now, the sin of murdering the Son of God, which is equivalent to rejecting the Son of God, hangs on them, and they will suffer a second condemnation and die the second death. So two condemnations, two deaths, two resurrections, hang upon understanding what happened because of the first Adam and what happened because of the second. Sister Lika. Mm -hmm. I understand the doctrine of the two condemnations, and I think I understand too about the two deaths. Now, my question is, can you say in another way the two deaths? Is it when the, person, the death that Christ died, when he, when he died, as you said, is the first eternal death for the first condemnation, and you die forever eternally. The second death, as we call it, when you when you reject what Christ has done for us, that, that rejection, grieving the Holy Spirit, you will die then the second eternal. But is it still eternal death as the first one? So isn't it all eternal death? Just that you're dying for a different reason. Isn't the reason different, but it's still an eternal death? It is still an eternal death, yes. A full separation from God? Yes. So why call it two eternal deaths? Because it's two. It's the same death. Because it is the same doesn't but for mean it different isn't true. reasons. I'm getting a bit confused. All cats are not one cat, but all are cat. Your cat and, and Sister Phillips' cat, that's why I bought in basketball, they're both cats, but they're two different individuals. So although our death is of the same quality, eternal death. It's for different reasons. Yes. So it's, so two, it's the same eternal separation from God. I know, but it's two deaths. So why do you call it two deaths? Because it's two. I'm wait, 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 let me just go back again. A person, Adam sinned and separated us from God, and all men were condemned to death, eternal death. Yes. Right. And Christ, Jesus, Christ, Jesus died, died that death. Christ came and died and canceled that. That's yes. gone. That's finished. Good. When man died the second time, when, when he rejects, if he rejects, sorry, if a man rejects what Christ has done, he won't die for the sins that you're committing. Because it seems that like he's committing just a reflection that he has rejected what Christ has done. Correct. Good. So when a man had rejected what Christ has done and committed the unpardonable sin and he's lost, when he dies, is it he separated completely from God and dies an eternal death never to return? Yes. And it's the same death that Christ died. In, in terms of quality, yes. Yes. But it's but a second death. How is it different? Because the Bible calls it a second death. And if it is a second, there had to be a first. And is Christ it, died the first. So is yeah. it called a second because oh. Christ died the first one? And yes. The second one? Of course. That's the only reason? That's the only reason. Oh, thank you. For example, when, when the second death will be taking place, follow me carefully. When the Bible talks about the second death, listen carefully. Christ and his saints 
will be in the New Jerusalem watching it. And in that second death, hell and the grave and death will be cast in the lake of fire. And, and when that death is occurring, that death is future. The second death is future. That's, for example, I was at the funeral the other, the other day, and the man and his wife looked at me and stressed, this woman's soul is in heaven, and those three men's, three women's husbands are in hell. He means that their understanding of hell is that hell is going on. Our understanding of hell is what? Hell will be the final first, so hell is future. The second death is future, okay? And when the second death takes place, the first eternal death that Jesus died would be passed. So although it's the same eternal death, there are two different events, hence first and second. All right? I'm not stressing this for the sake of Sister Angela, no. I'm stressing this for the sake of Sister Angela's friend. <laughs> okay. So I just want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the second death is any different in quality from the first. They're both an eternal death caused by an eternal separation from God. I'm looking at why the Bible uses first and second. Okay? First and second. And why the term second? Because if we understand the second death to be the death of rejection of the Holy Spirit, in other words, all that Christ has done for you you turn around and reject it. No, Adam, you, you understand why Christ died for Adam first, that first condemnation? Because Adam had not rejected what Lucifer had rejected in heaven. When we reject now what Christ has done for us, we reach the same point as Lucifer, and the Bible tells us that that second death was really prepared for the devil and his angels. Not prepared for us, because God chose us in Christ from the foundation of the world to live forever. When we deliberately reject that because he made us free, can't haul us in, we end up in what was prepared for the devil, because the devil was the first person to reject Jesus Christ outright and anything he could do. So that second death, the Bible tells us, was prepared for the devil and his angels, not prepared for us. God prepared a kingdom for us, but because he can't force us, if we reject, we will end up in the death that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And Jesus and the saints in New Jerusalem will be what? We'll be, if we are saved, we'll be watching that death, the second death. Yes, yes. Pardon? No, Christ did not die the second death. He died a first eternal death. You know why? Listen to me carefully. Paul says, no, don't, don't, don't confuse it and say I'm confusing it. Paul says that the sin of rejecting the Holy Spirit, there remain of no more sacrifice for. So Christ did not die for rejecting him. How could Christ die for rejecting him? How could Christ die for a man who rejects Christ? Listen to me carefully. How could Christ die for a man who rejects Christ? If you reject Christ, there is no sacrifice for you. Because you've rejected the thing that... I bring a cure. You, you have cancer, and I bring a cure. You take the cure and pull it through the vendor. Mm -hmm. Eden. One was pronouncing Eden. And his angels. Yes. Okay. Yes, Brother Desmond. Let me look at the resurrection. Can I? Uh, but 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 a mercury signal time is gone, so. Are you glad? Uh, no, no, I'm glad. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad. We can come back this lunchtime, cause yeah. we can come back uh, in the discussion period. Uh, I, I first. <laughs> okay, our time is up. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our study. As we go deeper into these things and our knowledge improves and expands because it is an ongoing subject, we thank you. Help us to understand and guide and direct us as we break now for our third lecture before the luncheon break. Continue to guide and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.